assalamu alaikum to our viewers um, uh, for Milestones. My name is Tanzeen Doha. I'm the general editor for Milestones, uh, commentary on the Islamic world. Today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Ward Churchill, who is one of the most important thinkers of, of, of in the contemporary times. Um, uh, if those of you who are interested in the real history of, of, of America and the American project, uh, and one of the main figures, uh, one of the main historians of that would be Ward Churchill. There are others who are of that same vein. Um, so today we would like to have um, a conversation with uh, Ward Churchill on uh, not only his essay that was about uh, the 9-11 the event uh, on September 11th, but also about his overall works and the connection between the genocide of indigenous Americans and what it means in today's contemporary war on Islam. I have with me my co-host, who's uh, Jalil Kolchai, who um, is also um, someone who contributes to milestones often, particularly on topics related to the war in Afghanistan. And he also writes about misrepresentations of Muslims in film. Jalil is also uh, a teacher, in, a history teacher at an Islamic school, and he uses uh, Ward Churchill's essay often in his, in his, in his courses. Um, I would like to first quickly um, read um, uh, more formally uh, a biography of Ward Churchill for those of you who don't know. So Ward Churchill was, until moving to Atlanta in 2012, a member of the Leadership Council of Colorado AIM, the American Indian Movement, uh, a past national spokesperson for the Leonard Peltier Defense Committee, an UN delegate for the International Indian Treaty Council, is a life member of Vietnam Veterans Against the War and currently a member of the Council of Elders of the original Rainbow Coalition founded by Chicago Black Panther leader Fred Hampton in 1969. Now retired Churchill was professor of American Indian Studies and chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies until 2005 when he became the focus of a major academic freedom case. Among his two dozen books are the award-winning Agents of Repression which was published in 1988, Fantasies of the Master Race, 1992, Struggle for the Land, 1993, and On the Justice of Roosting Chickens, 2003, as well as the COINTELPRO Papers, 1990, A Little Matter of Genocide, 1997, Acts of Rebellion, 2003, and Kill the Indian, Save the Man, 2004. So Ward, welcome to our show. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you here. I would like to first um, actually go to Jalil because he wants to ask you questions that are more directly linked to uh, the 911 essay. Okay. Jalil? Oh, so first and foremost, I just want to say uh, how important your work is to me. I think I've read it uh, three or four times. The first time was in 2017. And then uh, I'm a second year teacher so uh, uh, in my first year teaching, I remember it was close to 9-11. I was like, I, I need to do something for 9-11, but I didn't know exactly what. And then uh, Tanzim went ahead and posted this uh, essay. So I went ahead and signed it to the students. Uh, my students are all Muslim. It's Islamic school. And okay. they're really receptive to it. I gave them a couple of just questions that to read the essay to find the answers to. And then I ended up showing your uh, Fox interview to them. <laughs> which uh, they liked a lot. They were cheering you on. And uh, I actually told them about this interview. They were super excited. They were like, uh, tell them that we say hi, and we're just cheering you on. You're talking about the ones with Megan Kelly? Uh, so my, <laughs> even though the word, the Megan Kelly, yeah, the Megan Kelly interviews, yeah. yeah. So, so my first question for you is, uh, when you first began writing this work in 2001, did you anticipate the amount of backlash you would receive? Well, I anticipated backlash, but... Um... Not the coordinated, organized stuff that began in uh, 2005. Um, actually, the backlash came mainly from self-styled Marxists in New York City, all of whom purported to have a relative that was killed in the Twin Towers. And all of the relatives, um, they not only had relatives, but the relatives were all uh, immigrants, recent immigrants refugees, things like that. And all of them, all of those refugees were food service workers, janitorial staff and such. Okay. That you'd think that was the only people in there and every Marxist in New York seemed to have one and they were all upset. That, 
it was kind of a travesty. It was an organized sort of thing, but fairly low key. And it caused me a few laughs in a way that the Marxists were defending the uh, stockbrokers and international financiers and so forth in the trade center. Strange. They didn't talk much about the uh, Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And that went away. You know, there was very little said about it after that for um, a period of years, at least three. And then all of a sudden, the right takes hold of it. And I'm 41 consecutive days on Bill O'Reilly, and there's 400 stories in the uh, local yellow press in Denver highlighting me. I had features every day. I had the front page. Hope dies, I had the front page anyway. Um, no, I hadn't anticipated that. You had a radio station that was dedicated to all Churchill all the time in Denver. So, yeah, it was pretty concerted. And I think it was a sort of an experiment to see if they could neutralize somebody simply through media attack. So it was an interesting experience in that regard. I had 6,000 emails in about uh, five days. They all said the same thing. Um, you know, it was bots. So hostile emails, and they're coming into my department, they're coming into the dean, they're coming into the regents, they're coming into the governor, they're coming into me personally, they're coming into faculty members um, in my department, just barrage. They were coming into my band office down in Oklahoma at such a point that they couldn't get any other work done. And, you know, you had thousands that were generated to all appearances by bots, Except there's some hands who are talking about how they do a trip All right. But there's an organized effort going on, too. And I know a number of the uh, organizational right that were responsible for that. I don't know that I know them all. And I don't know the extent of govern, uh, governmental involvement in that. But no, uh, I have to say, I really did not anticipate that degree of response, especially years after the fact, the thing had lain dormant. So about four years later, it became a more yeah. in the news. Yeah. Uh, in your, in your uh, initial, when you were talking about the Marxists who were talking about people in the World Trade Center, uh, I mean, that goes into your, your article, actually, about this notion of the, all these innocent people that were there. So if you could talk to us a little bit about, before we go to the notion of innocence, um, you've used a specific term, and, and I think Dalil wanted to talk about that, the notion of the little Eichmann. And if uh -huh. you expand conceptually first, and then I think Jalil has a question related to that. Well, yeah, um, I guess a little bit of anecdotal uh, information, how I came to that, because the bulk of the piece in question well, virtually all of it was written on 9-11. I got a couple of phone calls to figure into this. The first being from um, a good friend who said, are you watching television? This was in the morning, early, relatively speaking for me. And um, I said, no. I said, well, turn it on. Somebody just uh, hit the World Trade Center in a plane. So I did. Um, my wife and I sat there and watched the second tower get hit. The plane come in in the second tower in real time, and we watched them come down in real time. We're watching on cable news, and I don't remember which channel, but we started switching back and forth between them. And they all had this, essentially the same camera shot, as near as I could tell. They were more or less in the same position, which could happen because there's sort of a, a cluster of uh, further up Manhattan Island. There's sort of a cluster of media headquarters. So if they're on the roof, they're going to be getting essentially the same ang angle, but they're all saying the same thing. And one of the things that they were saying repeatedly over and over was all these innocent people. Now, at the time, they were estimating there may be somebody somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 people in the towers at this point. And it occurred to me immediately, you know, 
how it turns out they were fairly <laughs> fairly uh, far in error with regard to that estimate, but they were estimating on the high side with no discernible knowledge of exactly who those would be and how they could possibly know they were innocent was a little bit mystifying. But all three major um, cable news networks were regurgitating that right from the get-go. Right. We don't know who's there, but by definition, they're there, they're innocent. Could have had Osama bin Laden himself in there. They didn't know. Right. He wasn't. But that prompted me to address that in the essay, because the second call I got was after the second tower, while well, they came down pretty much together. Uh, within a couple of minutes of one another. Immediately, the big dust cloud was still in the air, phone rang again, and it was uh, the editor of a journal that I uh, was on the board of, Dark Knight Field Notes, and it ran a, a blog called Pockets of Resistance simultaneously. And she asked me if I could do a prominent gut response to to that, you know, inquired as whether I knew what was going on. I had been watching it and listening to commentary and could I do a, a from the gut analysis of what had just happened. So that's, that's how I came to write the piece. And I didn't try to address, I didn't know uh, either how many people were in there and what the composition, you know, of the people who were in there, who was doing what, but World Trade Center, it speaks for itself. We know the occupations that are going on in there. And it took a sort of a snap um, analytical position that can be drawn from Hannah Arendt. All right, and that's where the little Eichmanns comes from. And that's the notion in Eichmann in Jerusalem of the banality of evil of people who are otherwise unremarkable simply going about their daily functions for the personal benefits that accrue and the prestige, the standing, the whatever um, they're gaining from it at the expense of others. So I'm pointing out, you know, in that trade center, success is maximization of profit and consequently payment maximization of the dividends paid to investors. That's their stock and trade by and large. Now you got specialization, CIA had offices in there, you had military offices in there. You had various other things, but by and large, people who are generally in that general framework and people who have specialties that relate to it. Well, one way you maximize profits, say, is sweatshop labor in uh, the Marianas Islands in Malaysia and so forth. Okay, Nike being a good example. If you can produce a shoe for four bucks by chaining 13 year olds to the um, <laughs> equipment that you're producing and then sell a thing to black kids mm -hmm. in Harlem, which is right up to right the island from the world trade center if you can sell it to them for 120 bucks mm -hmm. okay even with shipping and all the rest of it and the, the maintaining the store outlets and everything you add in you're running at multiple hundreds of percent of in profit as a matter of course now that's a, a business success for everyone except the kids chained to the machine in the sweatshop out there in the third world all right, or the fourth world, as the case may be, but that's another conversation. Third world generally speaks for itself to people. And by and large, those profiting tend to be Euro-American in this construct, or oh, let's just say white. And by and large, the kids who are miserated with their childhood stolen change of those machines tend to be brown or darker in complexion. There's a polarity there and it's not an accidental one ties into the history. Mm -hmm. All right. So 
you know, I challenge the notion of innocence. Innocent American, which at that point had been reiterated so often, it seemed to be one word. Just spell it all out, kind of like you do doing uh, computer addresses. Innocent American, all one word. Mm -hmm. You know? Eichmann was the guy who uh, <laughs> coordinated the Holocaust, so-called the Shoah. Mm -hmm. And I just committed a cardinal error there, the Holocaust. There are many Holocausts. Mm -hmm. But that, that reference signifies a particular one, which right. there's an exclusivist veneer that's attached to it, but the deliberate extermination of Jews and gypsies, mm -hmm. straight off, but also other targeted groups, all right? Slavs being a major one, had 40 million of them to be exterminated in general plan east and so forth. That mentality, well, with regard to the death camps and the eradication of the priorities, which are Jews and gypsies, although the first people killed at Auschwitz, for example, were Soviet POWs, the real weight was being placed on extermination of those two smaller groups. Industrialized extermination. Like, no one ever accused, even the Israelis never accused Eichmann when they took him to trial. They prosecuted him for what he had done. They never accused him of killing anyone. He did not directly. What he did was the logistics and the coordination, made sure the trains run on, ran on time, the gas was delivered in timely fashion, the gold was extracted and transshipped to Switzerland and all the rest of that. He was a technocrat, a bureaucrat as well. All right. Can you expand? But that's sterile the, sanctuary. The, the Americans, uh, including many of the left, would, would say that your use of little Eichmann as a as the technical term, right? You're using it in a very technical way to talk about the function or role, which may seem like it's innocent, but it's actually performing a very specific function for yeah. the imperialist aggressive uh, aggression. And the I guess my, uh, in, in Europe did not happen without Eichmann. Exactly. He was the central. You have the you have the direct face to face killers. You have the the people who were dumping the gas into the entrance uh, where you dump the gas in the in Chambers, Auschwitz, and Treblinka, and so forth. You have the hands-on people. You have the people who were commandants at the camp, but the whole thing is held together by this technocrat bureaucrat. Yeah. All right. He knew what was happening, and he performed the function very well in a totally bureaucratic manner without directly killing anyone. Okay, just doing the job. Well, he was doing it for advancement. He was doing it for prestige. He was doing it for all sorts of things. All of the same things applied to the people who were engaged in profit maximization at the expense of brown-skinned people in trade tower. And incidentally, it doesn't really matter if one of those technicians in the tower had a brown skin too. They're mm -hmm. performing the service of a enterprise that was established on the basis of white supremacy and so forth. So they're collaborationists. Mm -hmm. All right. This is who I was talking about in terms of little likeness. I was not talking about the janitor. I was not talking about the food service worker. I was not talking about the child on the airplane. I was not talking about passersby. Right. And that's signified by what I referred to as a technocratic core of empire. You cannot make an argument that somebody who's working as a food service or custodial staff or a child in elementary school is a technocrat, is a member of this elite core, mm -hmm. all right? And basically that elite core is performing exactly the same function, exactly the same fashion as Eichmann, and that's what Arendt had brought out in Eichmann in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And she referred to the banality of evil she went, in a way, expecting to encounter a monster. What she encountered at the trial was a mouse. So average, nondescript. Yeah. That's the banality of it. Of people performing these functions by rote with no concern. Empathy impairment might be one of the psychological terms that would attach itself to this. 
Okay, it's a psychological disorder, by the way. But nonetheless, the conscious intent to privilege oneself at the expense of these inconsequential others, that's the Eichmann mentality. Hence, little Eichmanns. They were not in charge of the whole affair. But all the people working under Eichmann, under that set of rules and expectations that prevailed, that he, first and foremost, conform to, and the expectation would then be his subordinates conform as well. They're the little Eichmanns in that case, but all right. Basically, Arant's position was people behaving like this are the moral equivalent, the psychological equivalent, the social equivalent, the political equivalent of Eichmann. All right. And society, by virtue of her use of the term banality, Okay, society's permeated with people performing much the same fashion. Now, I'm not the only person who ever made this connection. Chomsky had made the connection, used the term. There's a whole series of people who had made Eichmann analogies based on the comportment of various vectors of the U.S. system, those who inhabited and performed the functions. Chomsky used it in relation uh, to the general public attitude and the um, bureaucratic, technocratic attitude towards Vietnam, where you're butchering peasants en masse in order to save them from themselves, I guess. Mm -hmm. be the simplest way to put it. So, you know, this is understood. You have this full surprise and the shock and consternation that's drummed up by Fox News and other aspects of right wing media. And you get a lot of people who are, are ignorant, mm -hmm. all right, which does not mean they're uninformed. The information's readily available to them, they're simply not interested in it. Mm -hmm. So they ignore it. Ignorant is to ignore the obvious because it's convenient. Denial. So are you saying that uh, the general um, kind of American attitude uh, as to why do they hate us, that kind of, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. kind of, um, phrasing of, uh, you know, as if America is the victim of some great, you know, crime. Oh, uh, America's uh, always the victim. Right, yeah. so uh, would you tell us a little bit more about this this seems like almost like a um, psychopathology uh, involved there where in, in the consciousness uh, of, of the general public that even though they're engaged that america as a project america as a as a power is engaged in so much devastation worldwide and that um to claim innocence is really difficult and you in your essay talked about uh, the different forms of guilt. Uh, you've ended your essay by talking about um, Jasper's notion of the four kinds of guilt. If you could talk a little bit about the, the notions of criminal, uh, political, moral, and metaphysical guilt. Uh, and you, you've been very clear in your essay that that's not just applicable to Germany, that it is applicable right. maybe much more to America, once we understand, like your books are very clear about how the magnitude of the devastation of the American project, that in fact, Nazis were learning from America how to actually design the, the forms of genocide that work. And so I would like to hear from you a little bit more on this notion of um, uh, guilt uh, that you've used, um, utilized, mobilized in your essay uh, from Jasper's about uh, the four kinds, criminal, political, moral, and metaphysical. If you could expand yeah. on that. Well, let me take a shortcut to Jasper's here. At a speaking event at uh, some little school in, I think, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. back along about 1968, Eldridge Cleaver was going to give a talk, which he usually did extempore. I'm familiar with that. Um, tend to do that myself. But his wife, Kathleen, was with him. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to think of something catchy to say. Because, you know, we're saying the same thing over and over again, which he ended up doing. Um, 
and <laughs> gets kind of tedious. So you're always looking for something to break it up or frame it better. And she said, well, I mean, your point is, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that actually, Eldridge said that that night and it got famous and it's attributed to him, but it was actually Kathleen who came up with it. That gets exactly to what Jasper's point was. Right up until Moscow, you did not have any substantive at a societal level reaction against Nazism, against Hitler. Hitler was quite popular. Mm -hmm. The first break comes when they don't get to Moscow in time in the winter and the troops are freezing and then you have a Soviet counteroffensive and that, that was something that hadn't happened before. It was a catastrophe of sorts, military terms. You could say the war was lost right there. And then you see a, a sort of a, a turn, but it's a very self-interested turn. Oh my God, mm -hmm. our boys are now dying mm -hmm. en masse. We might lose this and then the Soviets are gonna be in Berlin, which is ultimately what happened. That specter presents itself. Stalingrad got really, began to get serious, mm -hmm. okay? You hadn't had to have SS troops running around, or officers really, policing the body politic and hanging people to lampposts as they did towards the end of the war for defeatist talk, okay? And Je what Jasper's saying is that there was very little tangible resistance to Hitler so long as it was mm. all <clears throat> discernibly beneficial salvaging German armor, uh, honor, salvaging German pride, arianness, but also material benefits that are accruing to the population as a result of what's being done. This isn't like Bonhoeffer talking about who they were coming for and he'd turned a blind eye until they came for him. He looked for help, there was nobody left. They'd all been already taken to the camps. These weren't people taken to the camps, okay? These were people who were enthusiastic buying into Nazism so long as it was to their benefit and then all of a sudden began to move the other way when it wasn't. And he, you know, what Jaspers drew is pretty much from the get-go when it was still to the apparent benefit of the German populace you are guilty of complicity with Nazism, mm. okay? You have a sort of metaphysical thing of what your sense of entitlement might be, mm -hmm. all right? And your diminishment of the other, which in this case was non-Germans, whether they were your next door neighbor or people of all other countries, especially in Eastern Europe, all right? You have a sort of complicity where you're working for them. You don't necessarily show up as a perpetrator. Um, that cast of characters, that's one level of guilt. The next level of guilt would be sort of the Eichmann guilt, complicity, right. without the direct perpetration. Mm -hmm. Then you have the go along to get along form of guilt. And then you had this sort of metaphysical guilt. Well, right. um, if you are not actively opposing mm -hmm. the structure and system of the United States, by extension, okay, you're participating in, in one of those or several of those mm -hmm. moral, legal, and other capacities that Jasper got to. You're not innocent. Mm -hmm. You cannot be innocent. You cannot. We had a situation, nine-year-old boy shot in Chicago as a retaliation killing over the last weekend. All right, that happens. Everybody's horrified by that. But more horrifying mm -hmm. was that there were a bunch of other kids who were not involved in the shooting who were on the scene, and they did nothing to help the nine-year-old who's laying there dying. Mm -hmm. They got their cell phones out, and they're filming it thing closer to Facebook or whatever, mm -hmm. all right? 
And the point to be drawn for that, they did nothing to make any concrete effort to prevent the kid being shot. They may or may not have been able to accomplish that, but they also made no effort to render assistance once the kid was shot. Instead, they latched on to, wow, wouldn't this be neat? Won't I be a Facebook star for, or YouTube star or whatever star for my 15 minutes if I simply record kid take death rattle? All right. These were not the people who killed the young man. You know, you could say they had a moral obligation to do whatever they could to uh, save his life once he had been wounded, but they didn't. And there's not a clear legal requirement that they do that. But it's a moral burden. They were not innocent as a result of that. You could hardly say that crowd was innocent of what happened to the child. I guess my question, uh, a follow up to that, or, or to specify it, is one of one of the one of the aspects of your essay, which was really actually very interesting and insightful for me, was the scale of the condemnation um, that you had there. I mean, of course, the title "Those of Us Who Are Well Read" know that it comes from you know "Justice of Roosting Chickens." That's from Malcolm, right? Uh, and um, but the scale of your condemnation is really uh, significant because it is not only talking about a right wing. It is actually talking about a society level structure of settlerism, uh, the so-called American experiment and the American project, which, which is foundationally based on the genocide of American Indians, but also the genocide of many others. But uh, so at the foundational level, that's a very significant thing. And I think this is a very important conversation for American Muslims because they are, there are American Muslims who are now arguing with each other, but they're arguing about it from within a civil society paradigm, within a paradigm of citizenship, comfortable yeah. citizenship, and of course, not always comfortable. Some of the folks in the citizenship are having their you know, problems here and there with the law or whatnot. But basically, ultimately, the, the discourse is shifting towards how to be effective citizens, et cetera. But the way you are looking at um, guilt is very significant because it includes those people who, from within civil society, even within a certain degree of protest culture, claim that they're doing what they can to make things um, better or what they can to stop you know, uh, uh, the war machine and so on. So this condemnation then goes to the heart of the problem, which is the question of settler citizenship. Yes. That citizenship in America is directly connected to settlerism, directly connected to ongoing, not something that happened only, ongoing displacement of natives. So would you, would you uh, for us, elaborate on this point? Because uh, American Muslims are unclear. A lot of them are very unclear, or they don't want to take this question seriously for the sake of some degree of pragmatism. They don't want to take the question of the, of the complete, uh, the, 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 the decimation, obliteration of Indian life, American Indian life, uh, because almost like it doesn't exist. Yes, so they, they're more having their discussions among themselves and with other Americans. So it's like a conversation between settlers and junior settlers. And even the little tension that they have is making America more robust. It's not stopping anything. So at that level, like you're saying, borrowing from Jasper's, the metaphysical guilt is certainly there. The moral guilt is certainly there. The political guilt is certainly there. The criminal guilt may not be directly there because they're not the military apparatus doing the shooting, etc. So uh, I, I would like for you to, this scale is really significant because one of the things that a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote, political minded American Muslims say is that, you know, this is the concrete stuff. This is the stuff where we can point to something and you're just talking about paradigm. You're just talking about something bigger, but it's actually directly relevant. I mean, that would be a kind of elusive way of thinking um, to only focus on, a, B, and C, 
and not actually looking at paradigmatically uh, what's ongoing at the level of the genocide of American Indians. Would you please um, give us a little bit more on that? I would like to hear more <laughs> about the notion of citizenship, well, settler citizenship, and so on. Yeah, in the, in, in the essay that we've been discussing, and there incidentally were, uh, I've got two different variations of that. The one that was posted um, originally, and then a more refined version that was in uh, on the justice of roasting chickens, the book. Okay, and in that one, uh, the more fully developed essay is called uh, "Some People Push Back," and that's taken from a popular Hollywood film, um, "The Cotton Club." Now, some of your younger listeners may not consider that. Uh, it's certainly not current cinema. It's fairly current in my mm -hmm. aging um, frame of reference, all right? Came out in the 90s at some point. Lawrence Fishburne played a, a knockoff in that, of a real Harlem gangster by the name of uh, Bumpy Johnson. I think they called him Bumpy Rhodes in this movie. But Cotton Club... Uh, had black entertainers, first rank. Okay, that was its draw, but it would not admit blacks as customers. It was a whites only audience. Okay, and that was true for years. And then they lifted that uh, exclusionary law. So Bumpy and his guys got in there. Uh, he had a particularly notorious bouncer that kept blacks out and abused uh, the entertainers, kept them in line and stuff as a matter of routine. Bully. You're not going to bully Bumpy. He and two of his guys went and grabbed the bouncer, dragged him into the uh, restroom, slugged him a couple times, stuck his head in the toilet and flushed. Mm. And pulled his head out and says, what you've got to learn is that when you push people around, some people push back. Mm. Okay. And that goes to the idea that the United States history from day one and in its antecedent phases was predicated on, well, it's a fairly sterile way to put it, but pushing people around, pushing people off their land, pushing people out of existence, pushing people into forced labor. Push, push, push. Yeah carries right up into the present moment. Yeah, if you uh, entitle yourself to a standard of living and a way of life predicated on continuously pushing anybody that's not you around, eventually gonna run into somebody that's gonna push back in kind. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the argument was, that's sort of what happened on 9-11. That question you asked about, why do they hate us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, it's, you know, let me take a stab at that one. And I didn't know this is a week before this, whether it was valid or not. Al Qaeda took credit mm -hmm. and listed three causes. That was a week later on the day. I got two of the three. So one, let's try the number of Iraqi children that are, starving, death, dying of readily preventable diseases because of U.S. imposed embargo. Okay, the sanctions. Mm -hmm. All right. Destruction, the kind of destruction that had occurred as a result of in, intentionally bombing out water purification facilities, medical facilities, hospital schools, infrastructure to maintain civilian life during the war and then imposing sanctions that prevents reparation of that infrastructure and it's taking a toll primarily on the kids. So you've got genocide that's occurring there. That was my position. Maybe somebody who's, I said, you know, perhaps if that was your child, you'd have the same sentiment. But anyway, that might be a motive and incidentally kind of answers, why do they hate us? How could they not? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's somebody whose child was involved in the intifada that was going in there and was a little bit upset about the overall repression. 
-hmm. of the Palestinians and the expropriation of land and rights and so forth and the maintenance of that by an, a U.S. client state called Israel, the colonial beachhead in the Mideast, as their own founder put it, mm -hmm. okay? And children throwing rocks are being gunned down with weapons and munitions provided by the United States. Maybe they, yeah, same thing. Maybe they responded in kind, get the message. This is how it feels, okay? And as to why would they hate us? Mm -hmm. How could they not? Right. But then said, you know, it's not just there. It's that four million Indo-Chinese in the U.S. Imperial Adventure that it occurred. I think I made an intermediate stop for 5,000 people in a mass grave in Panama, for example before we even get to Vietnam, but now you've got, well, Robert McNamara put it 3.2, and then and he was uh, kind of the architect of the Vietnam War, 3.2, and then he later uh, increased it 3.8 million, rounded up to 4 million, which I think is the official number in Vietnam. That's just a dead, that's not counting mm -hmm. all of the ongoing carnage from Agent Orange, which doesn't break down and go away with, you know, deformed babies and all the rest of that. You know, maybe some of those parents, Panamanian, Indo-Chinese, whether that be Vietnamese or Cambodian or Laotian, you know, or we could back it up to Nogan Ri in Korea and the unreported massacre there, and that's just symbolic of a whole series of massacres and over a million civilian fatalities from the U.S. way of waging war there. Or we could go back to, oh, you could look at Hiroshima and Hiroshima, I have to pronounce that right. I've always had the Walter Cronkite pronunciation, which is wrong. Hiroshima. Nagasaki, yeah, but maybe more importantly, in, in a way, nuclear weapons weren't used, but they had practiced for years and done various technical studies of how to affect the most efficient way of causing cities constructed of wood to burn so that they could exterminate Japanese civilians, 120,000 in one night in a Tokyo fire raid. There's 100 Japanese cities that were raided by LeMay's low-level incendiary attacks in the months leading up to the two nuclear bombings. There's more that we could talk about in that connection with the Second World War. Back it up to the Spanish-American War, so-called, but really the counterinsurgency campaign waged in the Philippines, or a U.S. Indian fighter, as he called himself, okay, the general in charge in, uh, I can't remember which province, but I believe it was on Luzon, put out a standing order to kill any um, male Filipino that was encountered above the age of 10. Just kill him, okay, outright reduced the population of that province by about 40%, and those who were still alive were in turn. So which let, me, let me ask a little bit more about this. I mean, this part was something that I wanted to hear, was about the question of American citizenships. When someone is theorizing from within the civil society of the American state, and that there is a structural kind of foundational, foundationally antagonistic relationship to natives when, when someone is within this notion of citizenship. Yeah. So that's why I called it settler citizenship. And if you could um, talk to us a little bit about uh, that foundational dimension, that how even in practical, right? So in many ways, that would be performing the function of a little Eichmann to natives when one without any resistance to 
the American machine participates, or, or let's say useless resistance um, that actually doesn't have an effect on disrupting the American desiring machine, that basically it's a participation within the citizenship structure of America, which yeah. is... Yeah, there's always sanctioned, uh, actually there's a book out, I can't remember the, the author's name at the moment, called Marching on Washington. Mm -hmm which is a history of sanctioned protest of U.S. policy, usually with a war framing, going back into the 19th century over and over and over again, you know? And it never, it never. It did, I mean, David Dillinger and others claimed that the U.S. peace movement the mass mobilization for the moratoriums and so forth made it impossible for the U.S. to continue the war. What made it impossible for the U.S. to continue the war, I would submit, was something called People's Army of Vietnam. Right, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And I was in exactly. Vietnam. I was on the wrong side of that. So I right. speak from experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know what? what the U.S. What is kills until it's no longer profitable to kill. Okay, what you know, precisely what we see in, in Afghanistan and Iraq is that the local resistance, the, uh, uh, we can use it directly, the Islamic resistance to U.S. empire in those regions is what's making U.S. question itself. It's not Americans or what they've done in the anti-war movement. And so uh, I would like Jalil to ask, he has a few questions uh, for right. you, and well, then I'll... Actually, let, let me say a couple more to cap, cap yeah, yeah. where I was going with that, which I just kept tracing, okay? What was happening in the Philippines and the reason the general and all, actually all of the general officers corps there referred to themselves as Indian fighters and what they were doing in the Philippines as an Indian war, because they all were Indian fighters, right. okay? That war started in 1898. That's eight years after the Wounded Knee Massacre. Mm. Okay, which was not exactly the last one, but it was the last large scale one. And so symbolically, that's supposed to be the culmination of the military conquest of the continent. Okay, vis-a-vis -vis its indigenous population. But you can trace it back through a whole series of wholesale massacres or you know, things like scalp bounties being proclaimed. And that's for proof of death of an Indian. Any Indian, the state would pay for that proof of death which is about as clinically genocidal policy. Narrow, you can narrow the definition as far as you want, and this is still going to be prima facie evidence of a genocidal policy and posture and mentality. Mm -hmm. All the way back to before the United States itself comes into being to its antecedent colonial ancestry, um, really, to the side of the World Trade Center itself in the um, early 1600s and when it was New Amsterdam, Dutch colony, mm. all right? Actually, an area that was rented to the Dutch as a trading center by so-called rare Don Indians who didn't understand that they had uh, transferred title to the Dutch and that was inconvenient for the Dutch. So they sent out an expedition, slaughtered the rare town's proof of death again not scouts this time, they brought back some heads in a bushel basket. And then there was this jolly little game of kickball that they conducted in a, a square, essentially the location where the World Trade Center was built. So I'm suggesting that the spirits, the ghosts, the race, the whatever of this endless pile of corpses that is accrued as a result of U.S. business as usual, from clear back to before it was the U.S. itself, mm -hmm. settler, colonials coming in, the invaders, the predators, if you will, coming in, you know. Probably. Incidentally, perpetrator doesn't get forgiven stuff. The interpretation of history has consistently happened. 
and B, when it's undeniable to forgive yourself for it in short order. Um, David Creighton Adams has a good book, somewhat dated now, called Benevolent Assimilation. It's about the Philippine campaign. And you had the kind of protest of what was being done there. People were aware of it. And there were anti-imperialist protests around that. And it resonated with the public what was going on. The war ended and they immediately forgave themselves and declared America's a radical innocence. Okay. Uh, Beacon on a hill, a model to be emulated by the rest of all the stuff that you hear. Now you heard George Bush saying that you heard a Barack Obama saying that insofar as there's any coherence to anything he says, Trump says now, mm -hmm. make America great again. Um, by those standards, it's been a pretty great one year to the next throughout its history. Did a chronology. This is self-proclaimed most peaceful country on earth. And I did a chronology to accompany the refined as say some people push back in on the justice uh, roosting chickens. And it doesn't matter whether you started in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence or wait until the um, treaty by which Britain quit claims it's uh, the end of the war of um, secession decolonization struggle, I guess you could call it. Um, certainly was not a revolution, but in any event, you can pick it up 1787, or you can pick it up when they actually form the United States itself rather than the Continental Congress and so forth. Could not find one month in an entire span up until I published a book in 2003, not one month in the entire history when the United States was not militarily engaged against one or several others. So- That was in the, in the, on the Justice of Roosting Chickens. The, the, yeah, in the book. It's about yeah. the documentation of how U.S. every month is engaged in, in war. Yeah. I just took it year by year, but it, you know, those things didn't happen in a heartbeat. So, you know, some of them are running for multiple years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a continuous tone, but that's not what's taught about the United States. What you're taught about our peace loving nature mm -hmm. and the invocation of John Marshall's 1803 statement in Marbury v. Madison. This is the government of laws, not of men, which is usually written as a nation of laws, not of men. Law is all important. Okay, the third part of the book in question is simply U.S. violation or defiance, refusal to uh, endorse international law since World War II. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's continuous. I mean, it's just endless. Mm -hmm. Stream of human rights, humanitarian, laws of war. This is not to mention treaty violations and so forth that have things to do with anything under the trade. So, so Jaleel, I, Jaleel has a few questions um, uh, that I would like for him to get to, inshallah. Okay, good enough. Yeah, so, I'll ask a few other questions after him. All right. Uh, so we're talking about America's innocence, and I remember in your essay you talk about how uh, American can make retributions uh, at, at some point, with, and you give some steps. So uh, you say the first step for America to make retributions is to admit to their mistakes and prosecute those who have committed those war crimes. <clears throat> Do you think 18 years later, after the fact of you writing this essay with millions of more bodies on America's uh, that America is guilty for, can they still take these steps? Or what, what do you think America stands now for retribution? Well, theoretically, you can always take those steps. Okay. You ask a good Republican, what are you on about in terms of judicial system, policing and all that, law enforcement? All right. Let's say here now, I'm for law enforcement too, starting with the big laws. 
we'll work our way down to smoking ordinances and traffic citations a little later. But let's start with the disposition. Corpus. There's a whole series of treaties which are, um, if you read the Constitution, supreme law of the land. Okay. That explains the disposition of that property. The United States might want to come into compliance with that if we're into law enforcement. It can do it, but will it? Look, the United States has a record that. They talk about how the Germans, after the First World War, refused to prosecute known war criminals. That's why they did Nuremberg, to set the precedent, but also because the Germans could not be relied upon to enforce the law vis-a-vis -vis themselves. Okay? The United States has a record of non-prosecution of known war criminals, including U.S congressional figures like Bob Kerry, who admitted publicly to perpetrating a little massacre one night in Vietnam. Well, war crime, prima facie, nothing, nothing, no response. And at this point, you got President of the United States instructing officials on the border to go down and violate the law if necessary, get it done. And by the way, if anybody makes an issue of your legal violations, I will pardon you. That's the attitude. And I'm not hearing a lot of clap back. That's not become a principal issue that adherence to legal standards by the opposition that's, that's posed to Trump. Okay. And you've got applause coming from the other side. So, 47% of the population embracing Trump, applauding that posture of flagrant disregard for legal requirements on the one hand, and 53%, let's say, on the other side who oppose Trump in principle, but adherence to legal requirement and uh, invoking penalties on those who violate things like laws of war or rights of immigrants, or refugees, or you can keep ticking them off. That's not their top priority. What's their top priority? Taking care of themselves. That's exactly an iteration of the mentality that I was describing as Eichmann. You know? There's not massive opposition to the war in Afghanistan, which is going on. There's not massive opposition to what's still going on in Iraq. I don't see massive opposition of any consequence with regard to the potential for war in Iran. I heard very little about the drone war that's been going on. What I hear is healthcare, and that's not inconsequential. That's important. Okay, equalizing uh, income, wealth, so forth, among the settlers in North America. You wanna keep ticking them off? These are all self-serving and do not really disturb the relationship of the entity known as the United States with the rest of the planet from which it extracts the means to maintain quality of life on their own anywhere above subsistence and not even that subsistence level in a number of areas. That's a matter of at best tertiary concern to those who participate in the electoral processes, the political uh, contentiousness of the United States. Now, you have individual exceptions to that. But individuals are exactly that, exceptions, okay? The concern need not be with the exceptions. The concern needs to be with the rule. So, you know, 
you run into this from all sorts of things, angles, if you will. We're talking about the history of the United States just a moment ago, and it being this uninterrupted series of military aggressions against others that we can list out the massacres, we can list out the relocations and other atrocities. You get a consensus, conclusive indication that particular event occurred, or maybe even several. They're always presented as an anomaly. It's like police policy is always framed in terms of rogue cops, the mass of cops are really good guys. Okay? No. The rogue cops are known to the other cops and they're protecting the other cops and you have this omerta like code of silence and that's complicity in whatever the rogue cops, so-called, are doing. The rogue cops are carrying the weight for the others and maintaining the order of business as usual, law and order. Emphasis on order, not law. Okay? They do history the same way. Okay, there was a massacre, there was a policy, there was a relocation, it's a tragedy. It's also an anomaly, it's not reflective of the overall policy. You had this bad officer who was drunk that day in the Marias River. You had Shivington, who was a lunatic at Sand Creek. You had Custer, who, well, Custer's Custer. And that accounts for the Washita massacre, and so on, and so on, and so on. The Immaculate Thing uh, oh, refer to this as the anomaly theory of history. And the question that arises is how many anomalies does it take to make a norm? Yeah, that's that refusal to accept the reality of what this country's about and has always been about, okay? The denial, the minimization, the uh, casting of it in terms of exception to the rule, the rule for always to the good. No, the rule goes in the opposite direction. So, <sighs> there's an old saying that in this country, if voting could change anything, it would be illegal. Well, let's have a big fight about it. But you've had Democratic, you've had Republican, you even had bull moose representation in the executive and in the legislature at various points over the years in the policy consistency from point to point other than stylistic packaging has remained constant continuously using whatever force is necessary using subterfuge where possible since that tends to be cheaper but whether by force, by subterfuge, by some combination of the two, appropriating that which rightly belongs to others for the benefit of those who are accepted by those in charge of the United States as being a proper constituency of the United States. Okay. Not equitably apportioned, perhaps, but nonetheless accruing. So that you have what, in good Marxist vernacular, you call a labor aristocracy in the United States. No matter how bad the workers have, how bad off they've been, they're always noticeably better positioned materially and otherwise than people out there in the colonies, whether those are formally recognized as such or not. All right. And in terms of defining who property should be understood, as the core constituency of the United States, I believe they put it really early on um, with regard to immigration law, who it was that was entitled to immigrate, and that was restricted to free white males. They could bring along their families, although they usually didn't in the early days, but free white male. All right. Maybe you knock off the male part at this point. That took them a long time, but it's free and white. All right, there's your core. You can work it out from there. Okay, others are allowed a certain degree of status and privilege by virtue of proximity to 
that ideal of whiteness, which is thinking like, accepting the values of linguistic customs and so forth and so forth of that core constituency. And if you can be more like them than not, which is say, unlike whatever it was you were that they considered to be inferior and intolerable, and you can provide a certain service or utility to them, then you would be admitted to the sort of constellation of peripheral social groups. Not, not the core constituents, you can never be that but you can be placed in a comprador position, a broker's position, okay, to help maintain the illusion, the illusion of inclusion, okay, but mainly to administer the often unruly and unhappy exploited portions of the population within the settler colony itself, which are those who were imported to provide certain functions, okay. Classic example of that, Chinese, who ended up being excluded when they were no longer needed for this purpose, but Chinese were imported, often against their will, to perform manual labor in the construction of the Intercontinental Railroads and to do hard rock mining in the West, the Midwest, if you want to call the Dakotas the Midwest, okay, hard rock mining. And then they get massacred because of white supremacist mentality, which is kind of like Aryanism on the one hand, and then excluded when they're no longer necessary for these positions because there's good white folk that will fulfill those functions. The tracks have been laid, now all they have to be is maintained. That can be heavy work, but not like laying the rails across the deserts and over the mountains and all the rest of it. See? So Chinese were brought in for that particular purpose. Some Chinese were relative, allowed to attain positions of relative privilege because then they could administer to that broader population of Chinese laborers, which were necessary for a while. You follow? You see repetitions of that story with each group. We we have a question from the from the from the audience, um, and I'm going to read that. It was sent to me. It's very relevant to what you're explaining, uh, and the question is about um, uh, settler citizenship and assimilation into white settlements. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the violent political stakes that junior settlers must understand if they accept settler citizenship? And what does a politics of rejection of that look like? So, um, so yes. would you like for me to repeat that question, Ward? Uh, well, the question is what are the expectations of the junior settlers? And um, what does a politics of rejection of being a junior settler looks like? I mean, so there's two parts. One is the settler citizenship and assimilation into white settlements. What are the violent political stakes that junior settlers must understand if they accept settler citizenship? And then the second part of that is what does a politics of rejection of being a junior settler basically looks like? Yeah. Well, we need a, a, a point, I think, of clarification here before we go forward, just in terms of use of the term. And... Um, those who voluntarily immigrate mm -hmm. can be viewed as settlers, okay? You got that scale you're talking about, mm -hmm. All right? Just to do simple shorthand, junior settlers. So some are more junior than others, but there you have it. And then you got people who involuntarily immigrated, in other words, were brought here by force. So. Different. All the terms are vexed at this point, but those who have been called African Americans, mm -hmm. all right, didn't come by choice. Right. So they're not actually frameable in terms of settlers unless they want, they still would not be settlers, but they can align with the settlers, mm -hmm. all right? Kind of like in India, Gunga Din, to cite the famous poem and figure from it. Gunga Din could never be considered a British colonial, okay, not a colonizer, but he's 
serve the interests of the colonizers. We're asking about non-blacks who are voluntarily here. Yeah, as you, you've also got black folk coming, okay? So it would fit that paradigm because you've got blacks who come voluntarily later mm -hmm. after that. Yes. But I, I need to, to draw that distinction. Mm -hmm. And the expectation, first of all, is that you forfeit your identity, your heritage, in a way. Because the whole myth, the term of the melting pot, well, it was never intended really to melt, but such melting as went on was for those who were not of Northwest European extraction to abandon their inferior cultural traditions. They were always cast as inferior and not necessarily even believed by the people doing the casting, although many of them did, okay? But to lose their sense of identity so that an identity could be imposed upon them by the pre-existing society of who it is they needed to see themselves as being in order to be allowed to fit in. So that's the initial quid pro quo is essentially in meaningful terms, okay, eradication of your cultural identity, period. You have to forfeit that. Mm -hmm. There's already some forfeiture that's going on, and there's usually a court, not always, but often, let's say, a coercive construct that has to do with U.S. policy out there in the world that is pulling people in this direction because they anticipate that the conditions will not be that adverse when they get here as those they were experiencing where they came from. So they are already in the process of forfeiting sense of place and community, you know, not necessarily the same as culture. You can bring your culture with you. Well, you can bring your culture with you perhaps in certain ways that lack coherence. So arts and craft, cuisine, mm -hmm. um, things that are consumable ex in an exotic right. sense by the dominant society, uh, you're allowed to continue to discuss among yourselves, have social relations with your own language, but this is essentially an English only country it's not even in the uh, um, condition of Canada where they have signs that are printed in both English and French. And then some indigenous peoples have insisted that in their areas that it also be printed in their language, which has been, you know, their language, it's an oral tradition. So they, you had to make that initial transposition, but the, the symbolic gesture, okay. Mm -hmm but to to maintain something resembling the cultural reality that you grow into your sense of who you are in that sense it has to go away you can form communities but insofar as you attempt to maintain that sense of cultural integrity and identity in a meaningful way you're going to be targeted for surveillance you're going to be targeted for penetration disruption quite possibly imprisonment, mm -hmm. deportation, and so forth. Okay. That's the first aspect of it. That's done whether willing or not. It's presumptively, your, your, your willingness is presumptive mm -hmm. once you immigrate. You choose to immigrate. It's not necessarily you chose to give up all of this other stuff, but then you're rewarded if you take a position leading your community in that direction of sociocultural dissolution, atomization, and consequent inability to form any kind of dare I say resistance, mm -hmm. resistance to assimilation, for example, and make that a threshold, mm -hmm. but an attempt to change the uh, US policy,
trajectories that created the conditions to which led to you immigrating or becoming a refugee in the first place? No, absolutely verboten. So to maintain sense of self free of accepting imposition, subjugation, if you will, culturally, politically, socially, and so forth, and either actively or passively participating in the legitimation of the process which will put you in this position in the first place. Okay. Rejection has to take form of concrete struggle to alter the policy. Mm -hmm. the policy of aggression in the world, the policy of uh, appropriation of the wealth from so others in the world. The, not, to, not to interrupt, but um, yeah, okay. I guess I guess the question uh, was more about not the effects necessarily of the people who voluntarily uh, uh, participating in, in settler economy, but rather that from the perspective of the fact that being a citizen and being a voluntary citizen and settler requires one to actually just legally, structurally speaking, to be anti-native. And well, so from yeah, that, okay. right. So from I'm, that perspective, I'm, I guess my question is that the, from the position of indigenism, that they are at the receiving end. They are uh, the colonial settlers, participatory kind of populace, right? So I, I guess the question was about that, not whether culturally they're losing stuff, of course that stuff is uh, is there but the question was more about like okay in that case they have decided to take a position that is against a black struggle that is against native uh struggle and uh, native life in many ways so once you're participating in this kind of structure i guess this was the question that Absolutely they were asking correct. Oh, and so in many ways in and many ways 9-11 would be kind of the opposite act of, of that. Not, not to say anything necessarily, you know, congratulatory, but it's just as, a, as an observer, it seems like the fact that when you were talking about in your essay um, about the target, about how the World Trade Center, uh, how, you know, uh, a lot of the commentators talked about and in the popular imagination as a senseless act. But in your essay, you talked about how from the position of warfare, that the World Trade Center and Pentagon and other areas, that it had a certain degree of rationality. It's not just senseless from the perspective of just war and how war is done and resistance to war, et cetera. So would you talk a little bit about that? Because, because the World Trade Center is sort of like the symbol of military economic power of the West. So uh, I remember in, in your um, Democracy Now! interview many years ago, you talked about it very directly that you know, the way, for example, America goes into civilian towns, supposedly, and, and bombs a place and says, well, that could have been an area where there is the regimes and then dictators got arsenals and weapons or infrastructure. So, and similarly, one could argue, if you're using the chickens coming home to roost, the justice of roosting chickens, that the World Trade Center, in fact, is a location that uh, is part and parcel of that same logic. So, in that sense, it's not just a random kind of senseless, uh, quote unquote, like uncivilized or bar barbaric act is actually part of the history of war and how to understand that. Uh, would well, you expand a little bit on that location? More specifically, it's completely consistent with the rules of engagement as articulated by the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iraq, for example, okay? And here, example. The world, uh, the um, Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City was blown up by a truck bomb, big one. The federal building, a bunch of kids were killed, a bunch of federal workers were killed. Interestingly enough, no federal investigate intelligence or uh, law enforcement people were killed because they just all happened to be out of the building that day. Um, you take that wherever you want to. But, you know, nobody knew immediately who had done that one either. But it was a big, big boom, all right? 
probably about the equivalent of a 2,000 pound bomb. I think it was 1,500, but okay. That's a big bomb. That evening, Rush Limbaugh came on the right wing chat line, if you will. He's broadcasting that needed to bomb the hell out of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And somebody actually called in and asked him, why are we bombing Baghdad? Right. Yeah, well, I have to admit that I don't know that Sodom, as a George Bush pronounced it, and Limbaugh mm -hmm. moved on like a parrot and repeated it endlessly on the air. Okay, don't know that he was involved, but whoever did it, He's still deserving of the bombing, as if he's the only resident of Baghdad, okay? Because he's done so much to create the mentality which caused it to occur. That was the argument. Mm -hmm. uh, about two days later, it was confirmed it was this uh, sort of blonde-haired crew cut mm -hmm. Iraq vet named Tim McVeigh had done it. I don't remember anything about need to bomb Topeka and Peoria. Right. Okay. Because those guys, blonde hair and crew cuts, volunteered to go off to war, had so much to do with the mentality that caused this to happen. Just shut down. Yeah. That's the kind of mind twist that goes on. I mean, can't tell you the truth. Remember exactly why I went in telling that story other than... It's about the senseless act charge. That yeah. It's not, you know, I was just saying uh, in your well, essay, nobody, it's not senseless. That is actually logically within kind of the argument uh, of how empire works and the response to that if one wants to be even remotely equal in their logic that they would have actually look at the World Trade Center well, random site. That's the nature of the response. Now, it would have been a senseless act to bomb Baghdad. But a point that I drew from that was, assuming it was something that was coming from Baghdad, yeah. that was one equivalent of one 2,000-pound bomb on a target, and you had some collateral damage. Collateral damage is, run, uh, is uh, Donald Rumfeld's framing, a standard Pentagon speak. That's the rules of engagement. Okay. You take out the target, and if it's in a civilian area, okay. It's the fault of the people who situated the target in the civilian area, okay, if there is collateral damage, which means obliterating bystanders or children or whatever, whoever, okay. Well, you remember there were three structures that were attacked on 9-11. Okay, mm -hmm. and you're saying senseless because, mm -hmm. well, World Trade Center, for God's sake, what's that got to do with what it has to do is the relation of the United States in the world to the resources of the world. That's symbolically, but also practically mm -hmm. ground zero in another sense. That, that's uh, functional, but also the symbolic hub of U.S. imperialism. And the military is always working in service to that imperialism. And the military I bring up, because this was a military action, the Pentagon was the third target. So they attacked both of the World Trade Center towers, taking out the symbolic hub of global imperialism and the military capacity of the United States. Okay, these are symbolic attacks in a sense. Uh, those targets make perfect sense within the framing of the Pentagon at the time, taking out Saddam's palaces, taking out governmental facilities, taking out economic institutions and so forth. And yeah, there was collateral damage, okay? You don't get 
hung up on the collateral damage. And the population of the United States, by and large, did not. They right. said, well, that's unfortunate, but damn, Saddam didn't have to right. situate it there. Kind of like CIA didn't need to have a, a branch office situated in the World Trade Center. Okay. And so on. All right, these are legitimate targets by the U.S. targeting agenda. Okay. And, well, they were talking initially about there being 15,000 people in the Trade Center and was only fewer than 3,000. So you could say they took active measures to minimize collateral damage as well. But in any sense, you've got to accept the idea, actually, the U.S. computes anticipated collateral damage in its targeted attacks, mm -hmm. right? But cut line is here. After saying all this, that essentially it's in a framework that was established and applied by the United States and had been for a considerable period of time, nobody mm -hmm. gets together in a group and carries out an operation this well coordinated and effectively without there being a reason. Mm -hmm. So then the question has to be the reason, not why do we hate it, but what kind of pragmatic mm -hmm. sense did it make to conduct this action and proceed accordingly? And I can assure you that the uh, US intelligence agencies were doing exactly that mm -hmm. at the time. It was only the general population that was to be confused about the fact that U.S. policy, military, and otherwise had generated this kind of, well, the term of the art is blowback. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Can I, can I ask you, uh, that's very helpful. That's super helpful. Um, okay. Understanding uh, from the standpoint of how America frames militarily its war and its targeting and what responses look like and the reasoning behind that. Um, in your um, in your forward to uh, Stephen Sheehy's book on Islamophobia, yeah. you, you wrote brilliantly about the history of Islamophobia as foundational to Western civilization. But I don't want to go to the details of that. Maybe I'll ask a different question uh, about that. But right now, because we were talking about uh, resistance and imperialist war and so on, there's a specific line that really caught my attention. And I, I, I want to read that and maybe you could expand a little bit on it. Uh, you, you wrote, for reasons both straightforward and far too com complex to go into here, the strongest challenges to such ambitions over the past 20 years, imperialist ambitions, mm -hmm. have, have come from the Islamic grassroots and sometimes from Islamic governments as well. Does have things come full circle with Islam once again standing between the West and the fulfillment of the psychopathic fantasies upon which its sense of self was born and always has been about, right? So, yeah. this, um, so would you tell, because, you know, I was talking to, uh, in the immediate aftermath, I won't mention his name, <laughs> Uh, a pretty famous, uh, uh, renowned Marxist. And I completely, dis I mean, I didn't understand his response, but he was giving a talk and he said that, you know, uh, there's been um, so much war uh, against the Indo-Chinese, but they haven't responded in the way that the Islamists have responded. And, you know, this leftist uh, was very Islamophobic. So his idea was that the Islam that the Islamic resistance was basically based on some kind of, you know, pathological response, but you are taking a very different position. You're showing that historically there's a very specific relationship between Islamophobia and the Western civilization. And therefore you're also articulating that there are complex reasons why the Islamic world, the Islamic grassroots in particular, have also posed a very serious challenge to Western hegemony. Would you like to elaborate on that point a little bit, to explain a little bit? Well, in a sense, it ties back to what I was saying about immigration and the expectation of uh, divesting yourself of your cultural sense. Um, you're forfeiting that. The people who are on the ground in those, those areas, in large part, 
are not. They're insisting upon mm -hmm. something other than the Western paradigm, universalizing, totalizing um, paradigm of the West, mm -hmm. which is self-anointedly superior and to supplant all other traditions everywhere. So it's a cultural imperialism, a cultural nullification that's occurring, and they're resisting that. And that essentially prevents consummation of the Islamic countries right. from being put in their proper place within the overall global schema that's assigned to it by the centers of power here, secondarily in Europe, and for a while at least, secondarily um, also in um, perhaps Tokyo, although Tokyo is kind of out of the orbit at, at this point. It's of lesser significance. Maybe European bloc is breaking up too, which really makes it a unilater, uh, unipolar mm -hmm. world. But yeah, that resistance. And there's always the possibility under those circumstances, uh, I think Chomsky put it, they're always poisoning the threat of a good example. Mm -hmm. Okay, there cannot be good examples out there. If you get a, a society that actually is harnessing its assets, denying them to, you know, in whole or even in part to the imperialist consumption process and using for the benefit of their people. They must be made a target. Mm -hmm. Not simply resistance, but effective resistance. The more effective the resistance, the uh, alternative that is posed, the greater the threat as perceived by, mm -hmm. they call them globalists, uh, like that's something new, but that's been going on for 500 years. Right. I mean, the, the imperial project has been global in scope that whole time. And it's, consolidated itself incrementally over a period of time, and that's accelerated. But nonetheless, global, uh, globalization, as it's called, is simply a rationalization of the imperial project of a couple generations ago. Mm -hmm. And you can trace it on back, all right? But at the point you get to globalization, they're literally saying, and increasingly so now, 20 years, 25 years on, that every facet of the planet is assigned a place in a utility, and that's to be imposed. And if you can successfully resist that, you're gumming up the works. Okay. Only in gumming up the works, you bring the process to a halt, so you need more of it rather than less. And that was the direction I was going with it. Resistance effective resistance, which is to say conscious resistance, is paramount importance. Otherwise, we simply have theory, and theory is fun, I suppose, if you like to play chess. Three-dimensional chess is better yet. You know, you can completely tie yourself up in video games, or you can try to come to grips with the nature of the reality you inhabit insofar as you're uncomfortable with it and attempting to escape it find ways so, of either changing it in a, a manner that's constructive and meets your interests rather than some self anointedly superior group. Doesn't really matter which self anointedly imperial um, superior group. We just happen to have one <laughs> that's mm -hmm. pretty arrogant about it. In, in, your, in, your, in that same forward that you wrote, you, you wrote brilliantly about um, how Europe's notion, uh, the story that it tells itself about how great it is and so on is actually uh, kind of mythical in many ways. And it was related to actually gunpowder at a particular point where it could ascend to its power and so on. But you, you've, you've given a nice picture in that forward where you're talking about uh, the history of Islamic civilization, innovation and thinking and all of these other advancements that were happening in the Islamic world prior to the formation of the very concept of Europe. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that, that I understood, maybe I'm, I guess, extending a little bit because I'm an anthropologist of Islam, is that in your statement about how the Islamic challenge to the West and how specifically it is becoming a, a challenge for the West, uh, that specificity seems to, for me at least, refer to 
a complicated but but a long uh, kind of discursive tradition within Islam, the, the tradition of Islam in which there is a very systematic approach to retaliation against unjust wars and unjust occupations. Yeah. And um, I guess your point was there. And of course, uh, you kind of left it, I think, to other scholars to investigate that because you said that it's far too complex to explain all of that here. Well, that was in the intro to that book, yes. Yes, so one of the things that uh, was um, uh, really significant in your book on genocide was um, the idea of how you talked about, um, and I'm going to read a part of it. Uh, the Zionists actually make this argument about uniqueness as a way to deny genocide. And I wanted you to yeah. kind of talk about this, right? So the Nazi Holocaust as special and unique and everything else is not even close to that. And therefore we cannot talk about them as genocide. Because we know additionally the consequences. Uh, you're kind of- Someone can use that in- like Can you- can you I hear me now? I couldn't hear that. You were frozen on my screen and I was catching only little bursts of word. Okay, so I was talking about the uniqueness as denial yeah. argument in your little matter of genocide. Yeah. This is an argument that Zionist uh, historiographers and other policymakers always bring up whenever um, yeah, the Islamic world or other people uh, talk about genocides that happened to them. Uh, uh, the, the uniqueness of the Nazi Holocaust is brought up as something that's very distinct and different. So I'm going to read that part and then, because you make the case that genocide um, is, is much more global, and then you make the case about the, basically the largest genocide in human history, which is the genocide of American Indians. And you basically discuss that and create a case about, to talk about it as genocide. Um, there is a part where you're saying, and this is an excerpt from your piece from that part, the experience of the Jewish people under Nazism is unique only in the sense that all such phenomena exhibit unique characteristics. Genocide, as the Nazis practiced it, was never something suffered exclusively by Jews, nor were the Nazis singularly guilty of its practice. In attempting to make it appear otherwise, and thus to claim the status of an unparalleled victimization, Proponents of uniqueness have engaged in Holocaust denial on the grand scale, not only with respect to the Armenians, Ukrainians, and Cambodians, but as regards scores of other instances of genocide, both historical and contemporary. Um, I think that's a very important point. And uh, for those of us who are interested in studying the histories of genocide, and, and we are uh, linked to sites in, at which massacres are taking place by various sort of uh, post-colonial affiliate states, right? That it is very important to make sure that uh, we critique this uniqueness argument so other genocides are not denied. Um, would you expand that on a little bit? Why definitionally using genocide is so significant in order to think, think about this problematic? Well, this goes to the thing. I was referring to earlier with the universalizing, totalizing, okay, the, the imperative of resistance and what genocide is the ultimate removal of the capacity to resist. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand that genocide cannot be reduced simply to the dimension of killing, whether that be direct killing, immediate killing, or the imposition of what Lemkin calls slow death measures, so you deprive population of the ability to sustain itself. Um, shelter, food, medical care, and all the rest of that. But also, well, in the Genocide Convention, which is uh, somewhat, actually more than somewhat, this is a fairly contracted articulation of, of the forms that it takes. Right? Lincoln divided into three parts, mm. okay? Each of the, a bunch of subcomponents, but physical genocide and the killing goes to that. Okay, right. direct and slow death measures, but also biological genocide, which you would take to be the same thing and they try to cast it that way. Mm -hmm. But that's prevention of birth. Mm -hmm. So segregation of the sexes, mm -hmm. you know, by one means or another, or compulsory sterilization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm 
that accomplishes the same thing. And if you make genocide synonymous with killing, okay, you can impose these segregate sexual segregation measures or especially in smaller populations compulsory sterilization and they go biologically out of existence just as surely as if you stood them up against the wall and shot them all within a single generation so you know the implication there it's physical in that sense when you're talking about biological too eradication of the gene pool as uh, the frat boys would put it and that's a sort of a popularized notion of what genocide's about. But his third and most important, and he assigned the importance, not me. And Limkin, for those who don't know, is the guy who coined the term genocide. Mm -hmm. I had the concept, cultural genocide. So that's the suppression of language and uh, spiritual understandings. And uh, one piece of it had to do with taking the children from captive populations to raise them to be, to see themselves and their cultures through the eyes of their conqueror, colonizer, whatever. All right. So they would no longer be functional parts of the culture that was being eradicated in order to. Mm -hmm. Pursue the colonial project. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that in formulation of genocide, Lincoln framed it as an aspect of colonialism, all right? Is the particular modalities of genocide employed are going to be contingent upon what the policy objective is to colonize simply the land, okay? Or the population on the land, or some, some combination, reduce the population free of more land. But if it, you know, his implication was that if you're after simply the land and the resources in the land and liquidating the population, get rid of it one way or another, is the obvious resolution to your issue here. If you want to use the uh, population as slave laborers or, or whatever, then you're going to retain them or some portion of them. You liquidate the rest or displace the rest in order to bring it down to the proper population density and then you use them for labor purposes but you have to right, um, eradicate your capacity to resist in the process. And probably it would be efficient. You know, you got a short term set of objectives and a longer term set of objectives. Okay. Maybe you simply systematically and intentionally worked into death over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as it, that, formulation, which is the original formulation, is codified in law, you have five criteria, first of which has to do with killing, all right? The second of which has to do with uh, imposing physical or mental harm upon the group by virtue of their membership in the group. Well, mental harm is a long way from killing, so clearly you're as soon as you uh, move past the first criteria of genocide, one genocidal policy set to the second, you've departed from killing, okay? And you're gonna stay mm -hmm. departed, okay? The third is to create conditions leading to the physical destruction of the group in whole or in part, okay? Physical destruction, well, that just means killing, doesn't it? No, how about you disperse the group? How about you eradicate this land base so it can no longer, the group itself is gone. And understand, genocide's targeted at the group. It's to bring about group dissolution and disappearance. Okay. The fourth criteria has to do with prevention of births within the group. Okay, so that's a truncation of what he said, but it, it gets to the idea of biological genocide. And the last one has to do with... Um, the forced or compulsory transfer of the children of the group to another group, take the children away. Now, 80% of the definition, even in the genocide convention, is other than lethal. Mm -hmm. So you've got this much more complex phenomenon to deal with, what are the implications of genocide. And when you look at that, the policy trajectories that we've been talking about on the part of the United States are 
genocidal by any rational mm -hmm. assessment of legal definition with regard to the indigenous people of North America, the domestic land base, so-called, although you can add Hawaii to it, which is, as Anani K. Trask and others would emphatically point out to you, not part of North America. They're in Polynesia, so that's overseas expansion on the part of the United States, so they, they consider the state. Um, next thing we could talk about, there was a manipulation that allowed that to occur, but I don't think we have time to go into it. Yeah. All right. Every single criteria of genocide has been imposed and is ongoing. Mm -hmm. Is ongoing. Um, to the point now where they have this framing where indigenous people are third level of the federal government and they're free to uh, govern their own affairs in so, so long as uh, what it is they're accomplishing is consistent with U.S. policy objectives. So as a consummation, they, they will administer their own ultimate eradication in these tribal governments. Uh, Ward, there is a very important question that came through uh, I would like to ask okay. this question. Give it to me now, I have to take another break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, one really quick, which is, um, I'm gonna read the part that's really related to what you're saying in a way, uh, and it's more about the response. It's, it's about what should be our primary concerns with organizing ourselves for action? Um, uh, what should be, uh, how, what are some concrete and practical tasks in relation to that? Um, uh, I, I guess the question is asked from the perspective of the black struggle and native struggle and, and, and from the perspective of Islamic struggle. Uh, we're looking at those three trajectories and that's really has been the focus of our, of, of our journal. Okay. Uh, we're not talking about um, civil society debates. We're saying from the perspective of Islamic struggle, native struggle and black struggle, uh, what would be some concrete steps? And I, I guess I could add a little bit to this because of your involvement with AIM and you obviously, AIM had a history of working with uh, uh, the, the Panthers and the BLA and so on. So there was an interactive engagement with their uh, inspiring each other to engage in action. So what are some of those things that you could think of? Okay. Between these three trajectories. Come right back. Okay. Yeah. One second, Ward. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, interacting with the participant to make sure okay. that I have the question proper. I may have not said the question okay. in the absolute correct way. Um, let, me, let me just wait uh, a second. Okay, so I'm going to read what I have. Um, okay. Um, the question is about, I guess it's a more like a, um, a conceptual framework uh, kind of question for saying how should young people orient themselves towards efforts to take practical and concrete steps? Um, and why so many are focused on intersectionalism and cultural intra-community practices, is this fruitful? And what should be our primary concerns with organizing ourselves for action? Uh, what, could, what could that be? So if you have anything yeah. about Well, action's a pretty big word. I mean, there's yeah. all kinds of actions that can be taken. The organizing part? And the well, the organizing part is to Pick something where you get residents, I assume locally, okay, on the ground where you are and get people in the process of addressing that. But there's, a, I think, an overarching conceptual aspect to this is that from a position of relative disempowerment, which we find ourselves in now, and I'm not really concerned with which group 
we're talking about, however you want to slice that in terms of uh, group identity and so forth, subparts and what your emphasis is. We're in a relative position of disempowerment now in terms of uh, affecting fundamental change of any sort. Okay, you foreclose no options in terms of action a priori. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got this, it's been called tyranny, it's been called a hegemony, it's been called various things mm -hmm. of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. And we're not in a position to determine whether the context is violent or not. The state is the corporations that hire Tiger Swan and other um, contractor entities and surrogate police and paramilitary forces and so forth. They make that determination. Right. All right. In the face of that, for us to disavow any ability capacity to respond in those terms mm -hmm. guarantees failure okay the most you can hope is to develop a mass or momentum that uh, compels the status quo to contain you they will provide some accommodation okay give some ground make a big worry about it, but only after they figured out how to co-opt it, turn it back to their own purposes. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, and I want to be clear on this, mm -hmm. that there is some purity in armed struggle and that the only way you can be serious is by virtue of picking up the gun, literally or figuratively. All right. But you do not foreclose that ability. So you need to be prepared for that eventuality. Look, I'm not a pacifist. Mm -hmm. okay. so you have a whole book on that. <laughs> pacifism I'm not nonviolent. And nonviolent pacifism right. um, often pointed out to me are not interchangeable terms. You can be nonviolent in political practice without being a pacifist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm neither. Let's put it that way. And yet, Having been active at this point since 1969, I guess you could back it up and say I was active in resisting in Vietnam itself, which would be 1968. Pick it up wherever you want uh, in that regard. Late 1960s forward to now, I've been active. The whole time. Spectrum. And the question becomes what's most effective to accomplish what our goals are in this context, in this moment, and where will that take us? Mm -hmm. You make an assessment and you conduct yourself accordingly. And probably you're not going to start by blowing up the, the Hoover Dam or something because you have an environmental mm -hmm. agenda. Okay. You may conceivably end up there, but that's not where you're going to begin. Mm -hmm. But by having a continuum, you start where it's most logical to start and adjust your practice and adjust mm -hmm. your consciousness based on lessons learned in the process of the struggle moving towards it. Mm -hmm. You have to understand it's not an event, it's a process. Right, right, right. And it's a long march. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, well, you know, the first part of my career, I'm going to make the revolution, and then after that, I'm going to, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in for the duration, or, you know, in the alternative, become some sort of a fashion statement. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of what I see going on has to do with fashion statements and people demanding that show up a demonstration that my organization organized mm -hmm. and insist we all sign pledges of nonviolence in order to have all three of them be part of it. No, 
That's what I meant about dictatorship. The Jimmy has to do with the, the mindset that thinks that's reasonable behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you, Medea Benjamin, but okay. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So one, and I'm actually channeling Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture mm -hmm. uh, here. One, get organized. He used to say, I don't care if you join the young Republicans, get involved in a young, in, in an organization. What's wrong with the young Republicans will soon be apparent to you and you can <laughs> organize them to be a constructive force perhaps. But get organized, number one. Two, two, step out of the box in terms of the fashionable constraints that are imposed uh, because our fashions of the moment are not a, are not politics, they're not a revolutionary diversion or a form of masturbation. Mm -hmm. They really are. And maybe get over the notion that you're opposed to hierarchy per mm -hmm. se. That's like kind of saying you're opposed to the sky. <laughs> it ought to be pink and it's not, and therefore I oppose it. I mean, mm -hmm. hierarchy, it's all around you. There is a particular hierarchy or set of hierarchies you're talking about, but hierarchy per se is mm -hmm. absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, having priorities, for example, that's a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And unless we're going to yeah. treat, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. somebody's misuse of pronouns, somebody else's preference is sometimes being equivalent to genocide because there's no hierarchy to oppression. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're going to need to adopt a hierarchy which is called priorities and focus our energies mm -hmm. at the most urgent tasks rather than trying to pretend that we are in position, have the capacity to address all things, all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably gonna require an intensive span of more than 15 minutes and don't do it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, we, we're coming to cl towards the close and I would like Jalil to ask, he has um, at least one more question, if not two. Um, okay. And thank you so much so far for all your answers and responses. Extremely. Well, hopefully they're clear enough to do some people some good. So, uh, Inshallah, that's, that's the hope as well. Uh, Jalil, your question. Uh, so uh, towards the end of the work, uh, I'm just going to directly quote you. You say, uh, what will be next? Uh, what will it be next time? A far larger and more destructive wave of suicide bombings? Dispersal of biological or chemical agents? Detonation of one, more portable, one or more portable nuclear devices? All of these, while there hasn't been an attack sitting as 9 11, uh, this prediction in a way came true given all the violence we are witnessing everywhere in the Islamic world from Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. Uh, what do you think the war in terror has in its future in the next 20 years? I want to get your opinion on that. What was the very last part of that? Uh, what do you think the war on terror has in its future in the next 20 years? Well, I think it's going to be turning more and more inward, actually. Okay because they're developing technological capacity to engage in uh, behavior modification to render things more efficient homeland. And you're gonna have some pushback against that and pushback is gonna need to get uh, crushed. And the expansion of the term terror, which has been a very interesting process too. Technically, if you look at the Patriot Act, breaking any law and this close paraphrase is not verbatim quote i don't have it in front of me but breaking any law with intent to influence or shape political outcomes can be construed as an act of terrorism you know, i'm still living in colorado shortly after the uh, act was passed this was actually applied in literal form in Colorado Springs uh, against the group who were having a, a march. They weren't marching in Washington. They were doing the other form of 
masturbatory social protest. They were, they were having a, a march in their hometown. Okay, well, I shouldn't be disparaging of that. That's what they were doing. And of course, they were so pitted in opposition to the powers to be that they had a permit for doing it. And the permit allowed them only to walk on the sidewalk. Some march, you know, march down the sidewalk. Okay. At a certain point, one of the organizers stepped off the curb into the street to direct something that was happening on the sidewalk, delivering instructions, was immediately arrested and charge was terrorism. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the permit restricted him to walking the sidewalk, so she violated the law the moment she stepped into the street. Mm. And the point of the march was to influence political policy, literally applied as a terrorist act. Now that gives you a lot of latitude for charging people for enhanced penalties and so forth. And they do this over and over again. People, we're gonna change the law to fix this. We're gonna have hate speech. Uh, you're in California, right? Northern California at that. When there's somebody charged with uh, hate crime in, uh, I think it was San Jose, not that long ago for corn, but he facing a statue of Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. for Columbus Day protests, mm -hmm. that became hate speech. Okay, yes. so kind of like in Berlin, somebody happened upon a statue of Heinrich Himmler and they defaced it, that would be a hate crime. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, the inward thing, when you're saying that the war on terror in its future is going to go on more and more turn towards uh, inwards, you know, one of the things we've noticed in the uh, after Ferguson and, and, and the, the, the black militant yeah. protesters that, you know, with the new administration, they have actually are using counterterrorism language to um, talk about, they're calling, they came up with a new term, it's an official term, the black identity extremist. And this is something, yeah. because well, actually, you know, Micah Javier Johnson had started shooting the cops and so on. So they came up with these terms that are directly from the discourse of counterterrorism. So in a way, what you're saying is already happening. I mean, not even 20 years. I mean, we're already seeing this. Oh, um, I've been seeing it for a while. Exactly. You look at the FBI documents for the repression of AIM on Pine Ridge back in the early 70s, and you got a guy who was on the COINTELPRO, he was a major player on the COINTELPRO desk against the Panthers in LA. Okay, they sent agents in who had these specialties from all over for the operation on Pine Ridge. Mm -hmm. And he's actually talking about putting down the insurgents. Mm -hmm. That was the term he was using. It wasn't counterterrorism and all right. right. Was well, it counterintelligence? This is counterinsurgency. He's talking about which is low intensity warfare. All right. Well, that's truth in advertising. It was an internal document. It wasn't supposed to be seen, and they told him stop using it. Okay, counterintelligence, counterinsurgency. He didn't actually say counterinsurgency. But he's talking about how to counter the insurgents. So, you know, it's not a a major manipulation of what he's saying in order to just call it by its right name. And so, yeah, once the church committee stuff happens with COINTELPRO uh, coming out and all the FBI had been doing in terms of political repression, okay, mm -hmm. they affected guidelines, but there's always loopholes in these guidelines. And the guidelines, by the way, are gone now. Forget about it. Everything they were doing then that was illegal has been legitimated by executive order or by the 96 Act or by the Patriot, which was a cleanup act. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they stopped talking about um, extremists and mm -hmm. such as that, which the language they've been using in the operations against the Panthers and others in the late 60s and then used against AIM for the most part in the early 70s. They switched over to terrorism and counterterrorism. That's the loophole. They could still engage in 
many of the activities they've been subjecting every mother for peace to, for example, in terms of surveillance, mm -hmm. and seek to neutralize in counterintelligence fashion entities that could be construed as terrorist or they were conducting an investigation to ascertain whether they were terrorists, all right, and just continued. So COINTELPRO without the cryptonym and you got the semantic alteration and they have much more capacity in this regard now than they did when COINTELPRO supposedly ended in 1971. Yeah. But that's the direction I see it going of a media consequence immediate consequence here, mm -hmm. but they can sustain the war on terror with drone warfare and so forth indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And the whole objective of the U.S. theoretically, militarily, since early 20th century, well, they were in pursuit of a super weapon first, that they could decimate an opponent without incurring appreciable casualties on their own side. Mm -hmm. And they got it with a nuclear weapon, I suppose, except that, that second part was a bit lacking. You were gonna suffer all kinds of consequences for using them, all right? And we're suffering those consequences from the testing of them, among other things, mm -hmm. and the mining of the materials and all the rest of it. That, that's an environmental reality that nobody talks about anymore because it's no longer the priority fashionable oppositional position, but it's part of the, any reasonable analysis. Okay. But bring it down to a smaller scale. Okay. You can whack people all day long in relatively small numbers, not going to be the grand scale kind of super weapon that they were originally talking about, but a drone is a form of super weapon in the sense that you can dispense mm -hmm. carnage in measured doses, and even surgically, so they say, well, they keep hitting the wrong place and wiping out funerals and wedding parties and stuff like that have nothing to do with who they thought they were killing. But they can do that killing and suffer no, it, at worst they lose a drone, they lose no personnel. And if they're losing no American personnel, then the general public in the United States could care less. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, Jake. Military screw up, but that's about as far as it goes. Because mm -hmm. it's not our boys, mm -hmm. as they would put it, who are paying any price for dispensing this kind of violence and maintenance of order. Yeah. So it's gonna it's gonna go that way out there and it's gonna be increasingly uh, repressive in here. That that's my rosy projection for the next while. Mm -hmm. Until somebody decides to stop marching around and making petitions and having candlelit visuals and wearing approved clothing styles and changing their diet and <laughs> uh, conjuring up new pronouns that you're absolutely politically compelled to use, otherwise you're stomping on somebody's dignity and on and on and on, rather than coming to grips with the actual issues. Right. And to use the uh, wrong pronoun, but I'm actually not going to oppress you in any way other than right. And to use Carl, use Carl Jasper's uh, argument about guilt that the the lack of attention to action and actually really trying to stop uh, uh, this project, uh, uh, American project, uh, makes one part of. Uh, uh, guilty of, of yeah. those four kinds of guilt that he had articulated and then you have re-articulated in your essay. I yeah. would like to thank you very much, Ward, for uh, giving us time. Um, having you in, in our round table itself is a milestone for milestones. <laughs> that we have uh, Ward Churchill who um, uh, came and, and spoke with us so freely and openly about your essay, about your works, and um, we hope to continue to work together um, we're going to continue to um, ask for guidance and help in, in terms of intellectual production and political organizing and so on. Uh, we're very much connected to the grassroots um, in multiple ways, and we're always in conversation with the Islamic South. Uh, I've sent some articles to you to update you about some of the debates that are happening, and we would like to actually really connect those things, the tendencies 
that I was speaking of earlier. Uh, let's that, do this again sometime and go that direction. What was that? I said, let's do this again sometime and we'll go in that direction. Yes, okay. yes. Let's, let's in, in our next, uh, next time when we meet and have this again, we will probably talk more about the possibility of an interaction that's dynamic, a kind of you understanding outside of the civil society paradigm. Uh, so I'd like to thank you uh, for your time. I know how busy you are with multiple writing projects. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're most probably uh, going to finish a piece on the drone warfare for milestones. <laughs> and I really I very much that. like to. I know you're extremely serious about your footnotes, about citations, detailing everything, but the drone essay, from what I read, was just brilliantly done up until the 80s, all the way up until the 80s, and you talked about sort of the history of U.S. war. Um, I would like to t uh, end uh, today's discussion with, um, by reading a small, um, a quick excerpt from um, a letter that Malcolm X had written from Egypt uh, in 1964. August 29, 1964, he wrote a letter to the, uh, to the editor of, a, of an African-American magazine at the time. Uh, he was very upset with what was happening in the U.S. with the violations of, um, of, of black bodies. And um, I would like to quickly read this excerpt um, when we end. So, this is Malcolm X saying, while the eyes of the world are upon America, let us not slow down in our struggle against the American racists. Our course, our cause is just, our grievance is just, our demands are just. Let us not agree to a moratorium of any kind. The world is watching our struggle. Let us strike while the iron is hot. Let us strike a blow to destroy racism and the racist forever, or let history record it that we died trying and that we took many of the racists to the grave with us." End quote. Uh, so thank you very much to our listeners. Thank you again to Ward. Thanks to Jalil Kochai for being here and participating. I know a few and viewers at Milestones. Thank you. Thank you.